Praise God. I appreciate what's been said tonight. And it's uh, not something new, is it? But it is something we need. Uh, most of you in this technological age know what a default setting is. If you've got some electronic device or some computer or something, it's got built in, this is what happens if you don't do something else. This is a default. We human beings have a lot of default settings that aren't good ones. And if God is going to use us in any, any fashion, he's going to have to do something about those things that, we, that are natural to us. Uh, you know, the, the illustration was given, of course, of the, of the wilderness. And I, and I see that often. I, you know, there's a part of me that says, oh, God, break loose. And, you know, we have our idea of what breaking loose means. All of a sudden, you know, fire is going to fly and we're going to have all these wonderful experiences. And, but, you know, I, I believe with all my heart that the work that God needs to do the most is the one that we don't see. That's the one that's going on in these hearts. That's the one that's happening when we are in these valleys. And uh, it has, has everything to do with how we react and what we learn in those valleys. And there is a sculpting. There is a shaping. There is something that is going on. Uh, you know, the passage was read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And the folks here know that I have often used this. And uh, it's, it's very, very significant. Because Paul goes on after describing the fact that what he has gone through was not just for him, but was for those to whom he ministered. That's absolutely true. And I'll pause and at least uh, comment on that. You know, the nature of the kingdom of God is, first of all, we do not belong to ourselves. Do you know that? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. That price is the blood of Jesus. And uh, I'm certainly not going to go against that. Thank God. <laughs> I belong to him. But I don't only belong to him. I belong to you. I'm not an island. I'm not a law unto myself. I'm not some separate guy walking around on the Jericho Road with Jesus. I belong to you. And you belong to me. And so everything every one of us has uh, that goes on in our lives has everything to do with our ability to function in the body of Christ. Now, you, uh, you go over into Ephesians 4, and I won't right now, but you remember how the body of Christ matures? How does it grow up to, to God's purpose, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? How does it do that? It comes to a place where it draw, each member now, every member draws virtue from the head. That's where they get it from. It's not from my reserve. I don't have anything. But I get something from the head and I dispense that. It isn't just for me privately, but I dispense that to the body. But it's not just me. Everybody else does that too. And just like the human body, it all works together and there is a growth and there is a maturity. We've got a perfectly mature head. The body, not so much. And that's what the Lord's working on. But he's bringing it and he's doing it. And, and the life that's in him is fully capable of doing everything that's needed. But... He wants us to be intelligent about and knowledgeable about what he's doing so that we can cooperate with him. And, uh, you know, we need these constant reminders because, as I say, we have default settings that, that get in our way. And, uh, you know, one of them is certainly not humility. The very root of all sin is pride. Yes, it's all about, it's about me. It's all about me. And we, we drag that into the kingdom of God and we try to deserve God's blessings. We try in a thousand different ways to operate out of a spirit of pride. If God is doing something to show you what you really are, you need to be jumping for joy, which we don't do, but we need to be. We need to say, thank you, Lord, for doing what's necessary to bring me to a, an honesty and a knowledge of what I am because that lets me let go. Praise God. I need to let go. You don't need me. Not me. Not what's, not, not what's natural to me. You need anything that Christ can bring forth. And man, it's a, is it not a battle? Do you not constantly find senses and, and feelings and impulses rising up trying to challenge your spiritual life yeah we all do and we, we need his grace every day but God does use valleys he does use circumstances 
to deliberately put us in a place where those things are going to be challenged. You know, I often remember the, when I hear the word humility or something like that, I often think of the humorous story of, uh, w regarding Winston Churchill, who, of course, was a kind of a proud man himself and uh, didn't have a lot of patience. But he was standing there enduring somebody's praise and, and ongoing adulation of some individual that he didn't think very much of. And so he's, you know. <laughs> and finally, the man who was doing all this, this talk was said, and so-and-so is such a humble man. And that was the, that was the trigger. Uh, Winston finally said, well, he has a very great deal to be humble about. <laughs> so... That was, the, that was the end of that conversation. But that's the truth. We all have a great deal to be humble about. We just don't know it. And, uh, you know, God help us. We need to be... But, you know, the, the wonderful thing is God knows how to humble without humiliating. Of course, we like to feel humiliated because we want to be thought well of and we want to feel self-sufficient and all those things and oh God help us to let go what a rest it is when we just say thank you Lord I am what you say I am I'm not going to try to pretend I'm not going to nurture this image this self image that I have it's so phony and you know it thank God you're patient with me to try to teach me but I guess we need some more, uh, more wilderness here, Lord. We need something for you to continually work on me so I can, I can just get it and finally say, all right, Lord, I'm going to stop fighting you. Because, Lord, all we have to do is go down the road a piece. Next thing you know, boom, it just pops right back up and jumps in our face. God is going to continue. He is relentless at fulfilling his purpose. You know, Brother Bobby referred to Romans 8, 28. And uh, it's, it's, it is... That all things work together for good to those who love God. There's a little more in that verse. Is to those who are what? Called according to his, his purpose. Not mine. So many people try to latch on to what they call Christianity. And it's their purpose. It's how can I use Jesus to have a better life here. Or something of that nature. It's all about me. Instead of oh God. Everything about this world is worthless. Temporary. Corrupted. I need to be saved out of it, and I am utterly helpless to do it. I need you, oh God. I just let go and let you take my life and, and change it any way you see fit. Easy words to say. That's the truth of it, but the working out of that is a process that we, we boy, was kicking and screaming all the way, and belly aching and complaining. But don't we have an awesome God that is patiently working in us all the things that we need so much? But oh, I, I, sometimes I know his heart longs for us to have the understanding so we don't fight it. We get it. We understand why something has to happen because there's something in us that needs to be touched. And how many times have we gone to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and, and talked about how Paul, you know, had his thorn. This was sent by God. This was a demon who got permission from God to harass Paul. Paul pulled out every Pentecostal proof text he could think of to make that thing go away, and it wouldn't go. And he prayed. And then he prayed some more, and he prayed some more, and finally the Lord gave him the answer. Paul, you got a pride problem. And I want to use you, and you want to be used. But you don't understand at this point that I can't use you as long as that pride is operating. And for you to have to humble yourself and fight this thing and trust me in the middle of it, that's doing a job. That's helping you. That's working death in you so life can work in somebody else. I'm, I'm answering your prayer. But you didn't, answer, you didn't understand what you were praying for. You ever ask the Lord to work in you? You remember Brother Thomas prayed, Lord, mold me and make me after what you want me to be? Do you think he knew at the time all that was going, that was going to entail? I guarantee there were some deep valleys that he had to go through. And yet God gave him grace to say, Lord, I, know, I love you. I know you're doing the best. 
when he was having to go to the hospital to identify his little boy who just been who just died, just drowned. And he's praying, and he's he's praying a prayer of humble humble submission to God. You don't think that's doing a work? Oh my God, do we need to be delivered from what we are, and we don't get it. We think we can come and bring all of our talents and serve God. Yeah, right. That's what's wrong with religion. It's just man. But God is doing a work in our midst, and I see it, I sense it. Like I say, there's a part of me that wants to see the fire fly and the power and all of that stuff. But I believe we're seeing it. To the extent that we are hearing God's word, to the extent that we are agreeing with him, agreeing with our adversary. Many times he's the adversary that is set himself against not us, but this part of us that wants to rule and wants to get in the way of what he wants to do. But when you agree with him and say, yes, Lord, I'm on your side in this battle here. That's a bad guy right there. And he needs what he's getting. You put, you put every stroke of death on him you, that he needs. Lord, I'm on your side. I'm joining, the, I'm joining forces with you. I'm going to help you stick the sword in him. Again, these are easy words. But this is what it's, this, the working out of this is what our lives are mostly about. It's we die so we can live. We let go of the earthly life so we can have the heavenly life in a practical sense. All of this has been given to us. It's been purchased for us completely. But entering into it is a process that takes our lives, our whole lives to learn how to let go. But there's another thing when you go on in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 in that experience about, yes, God worked in me so, he'll, so I can help somebody else. But he goes on, he says, we do not want you, verse 8, to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure. How great? Far beyond our ability to endure. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the deep end of the pool and you're in a straitjacket. This is not some light little thing. This is, this is serious business here. Ain't no way I can handle this. I'm in over my head. In fact, it's so bad, I don't, I'm not going to make this. I'm going to die. That's where he was at. I mean, every shred of his self-confidence, of his own hope and his ability to handle what was going on. This is a Paul the Apostle we're talking about. Every shred of that was shredded. <laughs> every bit of it was shredded. And he had to come to a place where he, rec he recognized that. But what, a, what an insight God gave him into why all this was going on, far beyond our ability to endure, so we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. Do you know every one of us that know the Lord is under a sentence of death? Why do you think the Lord said, take up your cross and follow me? What's a cross about? It's about dying. What has to die? Me. I'm going to follow him. He died. That was his pathway to, to eternal life. That's how he got rid of what, would have been, what was such a trouble to him when he had to go through his wilderness experience. Why did he feel that? Why was that a temptation? He was still robed in his flesh. But he saw the futility of everything down here and chose the will of his father. Not my will, yours be done. To the point of laying his life down. That's what we are called to. Piece by piece by piece. And this is what Paul was having to go through. The sentence of death. This was, in other words, this was something God passed. This was not something, oh, that big bad devil helped me get rid of him. This was God behind a circumstance that was meant to really bring him to a place that God needed him to come to. And it was not for, Paul wasn't being punished. There's not a hint that Paul had done something wrong and God was punishing him. Boy, does a devil, has the devil ever used that on you? Yeah, you get in some little pickle and boy, the God's mad at you about something. Hogwash. God is a father who loves us. He's a shepherd who leads us. Praise God. Oh, we need to recognize the lies of the devil and start going by this. 
This is our defense. We've got truth here. And we've got the one who is truth on the inside. Praise the Lord. But anyway, why did it happen? This happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. You've got an impossible situation, way beyond anything he could handle. And so he said, all right, I can't rely on myself. on this. Lord, I'm just relying on you. You have power to raise the dead. Even if I die here, if it's your purpose, you can raise me from the dead. Lord, you've got all the power in the world. Is that not what God's trying to teach us? I've said it so many times, we live with this delusion that we can do stuff. Now I'm talking about not earthly stuff, but heavenly stuff. You know, there's not a single thing that any person in here can do out of their own natural resources that will have any impact on eternity. There's a kingdom that he has created by his power, out of, energized by his life, and that is what he's bringing us into. And the only way we're going to partake of that is to leave the other behind and allow it, to, allow it to die. And that's what God is doing in our lives and all of these things. And I, man, it's easy to stand up here and say this, but you, you know what Bobby's talking about is exactly right. It doesn't make it easy. We do get in the valleys. We get in places where we really have to cry out to God for help. We have to, and, and we fight it. That's the reason it's so distressing. You know, I, I used Hudson Taylor recently as an as a amazing example of somebody who learned some deep secrets. And there, there came a point in his life when he was, there would be valleys that would, he, that would come upon him. And he, he had learned, so learned the Lord's ways at that point in his life that he could whistle. I mean, there was a terrible, distressing situation that was reported to him, and the worker was sitting there, what in the world? I just told him, you know, so-and-so so had just attacked one of the mission stations, and he's whistling. But what he was whistling was, Jesus, I am resting, resting, in the joy of what thou art. He had just come to a place where there was such a deep trust that had been worked in him by the things that he had had to confront in the past, that he learned God was faithful, and he was able to stand there and just, in the, in the moment, to, to immediately say, Lord, I'm just, it's in your hands. I'm resting. It wasn't that he didn't care, but he was trusting the hand of his heavenly Father. Man, I wish you could learn that by just reading a book or, or go, sitting through a lecture. doesn't come that way. We have to learn it by going through the arena of life and learning that God is faithful. It's exactly right. We don't learn on the mountaintop much. We enjoy God. We praise Him. He's, we learn He's wonderful and all of that. But we learn the things that matter. The things that deliver us from what we naturally are. We learn them in the valley where we have to say, Lord, thank you for sticking the sword in that. It needed it. I needed to come to a place because I didn't realize I was trusting myself. I didn't understand the degree to which I had self-confidence. Self was really at the center of how I was acting and reacting. But you saw it. Lord, what amazes me is you've been with me all this time and you knew this. You ever, you ever come to that, to a place in your life and, my God, what you just showed me just shocking to me. Oh God, how could you, how could you even love me? And you know, all this time, he's been, he's been right there with you. What an awesome God we have. How loving and patient is our Father who knows everything about us. But he knows how to absolutely take us through every step that we need to experience in order to learn how to let go of this life and trust him and receive him. And it does not come any other way than the hard way. But we can, we can make it a whole lot easier if we will cultivate a spirit that is going to go by this word, that's going to reach out to God, that's going to pray, that's going to get to know him, that's going to do our part to cooperate, not out of self now. Don't think you can build your bulk yourself up and your self-will and get through it. That's not it. It's, the other, it's exactly the opposite. But we, we just cooperate knowledgeably. 
And I tell you, God can give us a peace and a joy in the midst of something that would be, that would drive somebody else bananas. Praise God. We have an awesome God. But look how he helped uh, you know, this apostle. Look what he had to do for him. If he had to do that for him, you suppose maybe we might need a little? If Jesus, the Son of God, learned obedience by the things that he suffered, you got some other way? I tell you, the obedience that he's talking about there is the ability to obey God when we've got impulses that don't want to. And we have to learn to put them to death and we have to learn to rely on God's power to do that and God's everything to do that. But I'll tell you, the Lord knows how to take us through everything. But hey, Bobby's exactly right. He never leaves us. He is there every single step of the, of the way. You think of the Israelites. Bunch of rebels for the most part. And yet God brought them step by step through the wilderness. They never lacked a meal. They were in a place that you, where they could not trust themselves. Nothing. What are we going to do? There's no supply wagon out here. But God fed them angels food. Every single day. Their shoes didn't wear out. This, these people were, were mostly rebels. And yet God was gracious to them. Will he not be gracious to his people who look to him and trust him with every situation? My God, we got somebody we can look to and trust in every valley of our lives. And know that he is, his promise is, is true. He's faithful. He is going to see us right to the other side. And we will dwell in his house forever. Praise God. It's as sure as if it's been done. Because he is sure. Praise God. Praise God. I appreciate this tonight. Appreciate how the Lord helps us to, to know him. He wants us to know him. Because, you know, the more we know him, the more we can trust him. I think that's what it really comes to is we, we trust the shepherd. As you know, it's right, David. David said, you know, uh, you know sometimes we, we find ourselves in these valleys, just like Bobby said, and we got there because of, our, of our, kind of our own making. Lord was leading this way, and we decided I'm going to go off this way. And thank God that's when the scripture talks about he'll leave the 99 sheep sometime if he has two to, to go and get that one. I'm, I'm thankful. He's so gracious. But there are times, just like David found, where we find ourselves in that valley and we look around and, and there's the shepherd. He led us <laughs> that way. We're there because that's where he is. And, but, you know, we don't have to be afraid of that. I, I think the Lord wants us to know we can trust him. I was thinking about that scripture tonight. I was thinking about that, about trusting their shepherd, the way he leads. And, and I thought about that scripture. It's in Jeremiah 17 where he said, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. He's going to be like that, like a tree that's planted by the river. You know, the roots go down. There's something to get a hold of there. And it says, it, says, uh, it will not fear when heat comes. It doesn't say whether heat comes. It says, well, heat's going to come. There'll be those times. There'll be those places. But that's the difference. That tree doesn't have to be afraid because <laughs> it's plugged into something. There's roots there that have got a hold of something, and, and it's going to carry it through. In fact, it says that uh, it says his leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. And not only just we're going to be in the valley and we're going to make it. We'll survive. We'll get through it. It says it never fails to bear fruit in the least favorable conditions, seemingly, even then, it can still bear fruit that can help somebody else. That can be a, a food for somebody else. I believe that's what can come when we trust our Heavenly Father. Be like Abraham. Abraham just believed God. That, and so when God said go, he did. He trusted him, whether it made sense or not or, or whatever. I, I'm so thankful we can trust him. I'm so thankful he knows what he's doing. I'm thankful he's leading us. I, I'm, I'm glad. He's the good shepherd. Praise God. He goes out before the sheep and prepares the way. I, I'm thankful for that.